Welcome once again to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's look at the uh, stories making headlines across Nigeria today. We are going to be joined by, or we have been joined rather by our guest, uh, Mr. Chris Wandu, who is the publisher of CKN News. Good morning. Thanks for joining us, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you are having a nice day. Yes, we are. Good to see you. All right, we're starting with stories from the Punch newspapers, uh, which, of course, uh, should be on your screen in just a few seconds. Um, the big one there, it says, uh, APC multiple court cases, aggrieved members, Dare Buni uh, uh, panel compiles litigants list. We won't withdraw cases. Buhari party can't stop suits, says aggrieved members. And this also says, we stand by NEC decision that all court cases must be withdrawn, says party. Protest Rock Otter Road, or rather, or rather protest Rock Otter over bad roads, residents block a Belkota Lagos Highway. Also on the punch, Asu Fresh strike a threat causing panic. No agreement yet, says the federal government. Nigeria spends 1.47 trillion naira on petrol imports in six months. Poor prosecution endangering victims and others, says the CJN. And also conflicting judgments, NJC invites three judges one's chief judges um, across the country, I believe. Wiki orders value-added tax collection. Lagos bill scales second reading. And CSOs knock FIRS over proposed social media tax. Oof. Still on the punch this morning. Illegal admission. Federal government compiles errant varsities list. And conflicting court orders obstacle to credible polls, says INEC. A few others. Buhari constitutes health reform panel, appoints... Um, Agtifa and NCC, NCDC boss. And um, stop preferential cutoff marks for northerners, Elrify tells Jam. And uh, NNPC begins sale of shares in 2024. Let's take a look at the Daily Trust newspaper. The headline says Lockdown, heavy clampdown on bandits in Zamfara. Operation successful, bandits instigating locals to protest. They're on the run, releasing captives. That's according to Matawali. Residents say they will endure the pain of the security measures. And over 40 rustled, rustlers killed. Logistics hideouts bombed in Kaduna. Cholera kills 2,141 in 23 states and the FCT. That's according to the NCDC. Value added tax. WK moves to enforce law as court rejects FIRS injunction. Unrest, federal government, governors, religious leaders move to save Plateau State. Buhari constitutes health sector reform committee, names Oshimbajo as chairman. Commuters stranded as protests rocks Lagos Abekuta Highway. Kidnappers abduct former Akwaibom senator. CGN reads riot act, cautions chief judges on expert orders and conflicting rulings orders them to take absolute charge in assigning cases, and grills seven CJs for over six hours. All right. And out of the nation newspapers. Conflicted orders, three judges to face NJC panel. CGN condemns embarrassing orders. INEC says how courts uh, uh, stall election process. Mietiala to sue southern governors for open grazing ban. And also, gunmen kill police sergeant, abduct ex-senator. Pension fund rises to 12.8 trillion naira. Also on the nation, Nigeria's wild polio-free status not threatened. Um, Igbo Ho's case for hearing has been a court resumes. That's also on the nation. And uh, sit at home, crippling southeast, governor's lament. The vice president, Yemi Ushimbaju, heads health sector reform team. As a final one on the nation newspapers this morning. Let's take a final look at the leadership newspaper. States begin consultation over VAT verdict as court quashes FIRS application. Agency was collecting VAT in error ab initio court rules. Judgment recipe for economic chaos, says Masari. Wiki alleges conspiracy, demands full implementation of Rivers Tax Law 2021. 2023, Umahi says it's too early to discuss Igbo presidency. Ex-Rivers military governor Anthony Upo dies at 74. Nigeria records 121 type 2 polio cases. Guinea coup leader bars government officials from foreign travel. 
Miete Allah vows to sue governors over anti grazing law and conflicting orders three judges to face disciplinary action. All right. Um, Chris Wandu, uh, good morning once again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. So let's bring you in, first of all, on the controversy concerning value-added tax. The FIRS initially had challenged that. The courts ruled in favor of the River State government. But now also the governor of Katsina State, uh, Masari, is also complaining about that ruling. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, um, the FRS uh, failed in its bid um, to secure an interlocutory injunction, um, um, stopping the River State um, government uh, from implementing the state VAT law. Uh, don't forget uh, a court uh, of competent jurisdiction uh, within River State um, gave, uh, gave that judgment, uh, which was instituted by the River State government, which believed that um, the issue of tax, or especially VAT, is more of um, a state affair and not a federal affair. And it feels that uh, it's not within the exclusive list uh, of the Constitution. And validly, the court um, uh, gave the verdict uh, in support of that, uh, in support of the application of river states. And um, that is how uh, initially it was um, the governor of um, river states said that they wanted to see the outcome of um, the uh, interlocutory injunction, which was uh, um, filed by FRS, that is like the court uh, found no merit in that application and uh, it wasn't granted. So, River State is going ahead with um, the implementation of that bad law. And Lagos State also is also gearing up, um, also wants to uh, begin the as as well. And uh, personally, I think it's a constitutional thing. Um, so, if the court, uh, uh, court of complete jurisdiction has seen um, some senses um, in what they've said, then it remains what it is. If um, the FRS or the federal, um, federal government feel that um, that judgment is um, is not the right thing, what they need to do is to appeal to court of appeal, and uh, and um, if that is not also, any of them, either of them can also go as as, as far as the Supreme Court, but. I have always been one of those that um, believe that it should, uh, the state should be allowed um, to collect um, th those VATs. Uh, because what we have presently is that you see states um, that are not even doing well um, now come to share, come to the table to share out of the VAT um, collected from several other states. And um, let's give you a, a typical example. There are some, especially in the north, there are so many states in the north that don't believe in alcohol. They don't, you see them smashing bottles every day, like the one that you have the heat bar, his bar that goes around arresting people, closing down bars and the rest of them. And when you see the sea truck of a um, load of um, um, uh, beer, they get them, destroy them and the rest of them. But that same um, uh, alcoholic drinks uh, get uh, vatted in other states like Lagos, River, and some other states from the, uh, from the south. And they share out of that. So you can see the hypocrisy in that. So, um, and from what I've seen now, it's like close to about 40% of what is generated in VAT comes from Lagos, over 40%. But that will be shared among the 36 states of the Federation and Abuja. So I think there's some lost side, um, it, 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 there, there's some disparity there. So I totally agree with that. But as I said, a court has given that VAT. The Katina state governor has the right to whatever he wants. If it's not if it's not standing on the point of law, then he has no value. But if he, he also feel like challenging, he as well, as well can go to court. But okay. can he go to court uh, against a, a, a law uh, that is taking place in uh, in River State? <laughs> that would I have that power? All right, Mister Wando, you've just said that states have the rights to collect VAT. Just states that's also what have the, the right. Is, Sorry, at least for now. I said that's what the constitution says for now, based you... on the court. Pardon. Do you also think that states have the rights to ban open grazing in their states? And I ask that because when we look at the um, leadership newspaper, as well as the paper, The Nation, it talks about Mieti Allah here vowing to sue governors over anti-grazing laws. Now, Mieti Allah is saying that these anti-grazing laws will basically deprive um, and deny pastoralists from their livelihoods. 
And recall that southern governors had taken a stance to ban open grazing on September 1st. And so many other northern states like Zamfara, Kaduna and Katsina have also banned a movement of cattle in their states. But Mietiala is, you know, saying they will take this to court. So the states also have a right to ban open grazing in their states. The states have the right to ban anything in the states. That's why you have the State House of Assembly. The State House of Assembly makes law for the states, mm. while the National Assembly makes law for the nation. So if the states find it necessary that there is need for peace and security within the states, that there is need for them to uh, come up with such law, they have the right. Once it has gone through the uh, constitutional means, through the State Houses of Assembly, and they pass it, and once it is signed into law by the governor of that state, it becomes a law. We are not practicing a, a, we are not practicing a unitary system of government. What we are practicing is a federation where each state has the right to be able to determine what happens within their uh, state, while the federal government also has. So there is residual, there is what we call exclusive residual list. So um, the states have the right. If you let me ask you. Are you, are you not aware that some states uh, have this environmental sanitation law that every Friday, every Saturday, you don't need to move from um, within their state for about three hours? State governments have that right. They can, they, they can enact that law. So any state house of assembly or any state in, 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 in that wise, that will face that certain things that they need to do to be able to... Um, move the state forward, the, once that law is taken to the State House of Assembly then and is passed and signed by the state government, it becomes law. But if you feel that um, is um, in any way um, hindering your movement or your personal rights as a citizen of Nigeria, then you have the right to go to court. Everybody has the right to go to court. They can go to court. Um, it is now for the court to decide. But from what I know, little I know about law, I know that um, states have that right um, all right. So, that can be challenged if they feel they can challenge it. All right, Mr. Wando, some, something on the nation, who I think makes uh, headlines across uh, the papers this morning and also has been, you know, interesting topic um, in the last few days. There's a conflict in court, uh, junk, um, court rulings that has, uh, of, of course, necessitated the summoning of some state chief judges by the CJN. The Nigerian Bar Association has also spoken and also... It says uh, here, three judges to face NJC panel. Um, let's get your, your views on that also. As an elementary student of law, in 200 level, I was taught, uh, we were taught um, constitutional law. And <laughs> jurisdiction is one of the first things you learn as a student of law. Every court has its jurisdiction. And... Um, um, a, a court of coordinated jurisdiction cannot um, uh, invalidate um, any ruling by another court within the same rank, if you understand what I mean. A court in, uh, in Lagos, a high court judge takes a decision, another high court judge in any part of this country cannot invalidate that um, judgment given by that high court. The best you can do is to go to the court of appeal. That is how it is done. So what we are just seeing now is a total aberration. Is uh, is unconstitutional. The judges are just doing whatever they like, and I think this is why the uh, chief justice of Nigeria has someone um, said with the seven chief judges of those states um, to come to Abuja. And for me, it is not just about that. I, I don't. I, I, it's not the chief judges that should be someone. It's the judges that are involved, and I think that is what the NJC is doing now. The chief judge, uh, the chief, chief justice of the federation, does not have any right over those judges. It's only the agencies that have been empowered to do that. Then that is one. The second part of that is also the NBA also have to look at a, a, a situation where look at their members, those members or those lawyers who continue jumping from one court to the other to be able to get this kind of um, rulings in the So also the sanctions by NBA, they know the right thing to do, but they're not doing it. Mm. So it's both the both what we call the body bench and the bar that is um is is if, if before the firing squad now something has to do we have to do something as quickly as possible to arrest this situation or else we find ourselves in a situation that 
come 2023, the general election is coming 2023. If we continue to go this way, then we are going to be in deep, deep problem. So I'm mm -hmm. totally for um, the invitation of those judges and, and the, the new sister. And we are necessary. Some of them should be removed, especially that one from KP that started all this. You know, it means that that KP chief, uh, that judge in KP doesn't even know what he's doing. He doesn't know his work as a judge. There is no way you can do that. And I expected that the, the chief judge of that state could have called him to order because he's the one that assigned these cases. Although you cannot blame me, he only assigned the cases, but he doesn't know what the judge is going to come up. So I'm totally for this. Maybe we shall start using these people as a, a deterrent. And so that others who want to go that same route wouldn't do so again. Okay. Um, on the Daily Trust newspaper, this story reads, Buhari constitutes Health Sector Reform Committee, named Osimbajo as chairman. On the nation, it says, Osimbajo heads Health Sector Reform Team. Um, we know the crisis and the challenges we've been having in our healthcare sector regarding strikes by different health bodies and unions in the country. Um, now we're saying that the presidency wants to reform the health sector and they have constituted a committee that will sit for six months with Oshimbajo heading that team. What, what can we expect you know, from this committee and enter strike actions, um, final payment of, you know, what, um, salaries that have been earned by healthcare workers and all of that? Or are we still seeing the same committee formation and then nothing being done, Mr. Amanda? Well, I want to be an optimist, uh, but my heart of heart, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm a pessimist when it comes to this. I personally don't think that anything will come out of this. Tomorrow, when we are going to have um, we have issue in the education sector, we are going to set up another committee uh, who will be headed by. Who, don't forget that presently we are still having the issue of ASU um, that has not been solved. The problem in the health sector is very, very terrible. Don't forget that. Well, the federal government uh, through the chief, uh, the minister of labor came out yesterday to say, "Oh, yes, we've um, we've had some kind of agreement, and we're going to look at issues uh, that are great." And, uh, we're trying to solve it, or we've solved it, and the rest of them. But the only thing that is, uh, the no work, no pay, um, is going to stay. So, but every other demands. But the problem within the sector, the health sector, is so so terrible that even within the Asura, don't really forget that from our um, say from our, <laughs> the current uh, first lady Aisha Buhari complained bitterly about the situation of things at the, uh, the state house clinic. Um, that um, things are so terrible. Um, so, but let me let let me share that optimism and believe that something will, it will get it right this time around. To the vice uh, president as the head of that committee, six months report the look at the issues within the tech sector. <laughs> I don't think we can be able to solve that within six months. But let's how it goes. But for me, um, the body language of some of our leaders is not even uh, anything to uh, to go by. Um, if you see the way the Minister of Labor, who is supposed to be a lawyer, um, a, a, a doctor, the way he speaks on issue of um, uh, within the health sector, you are not hearing much from the Minister of Health. You are not hearing much from the Minister of State of Health. Both of them are doctors too, and the doctors are complaining on a daily basis that agreement being reached with the federal government is not being honoured, and that has been is very, very, very that has been very, very consistent with. Um, uh, this administration and the previous administration. I also let us look at our budgeting for health. The World Health Organization gave a benchmark for what we have, have what should be allocated to health, um, education, as certain um, some other sectors um, uh, within the economy. But are we even meeting up to that? All our um, health centers, whether at the federal or state level, are not. It's just becoming. A, 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 Places that people can't even go to. The doctors are not being paid. We just have an average of about 40,000 doctors to a, 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 a population of over 200 million. Right. We don't have enough. So I think that the, let's give the vice president and the committee ben the benefit of that and see what they can come up with. Well, Personally, the, the vice president has also you know, headed other committees uh, in the past. Um, you know, and I also saw some people complain. You know, that you should have been a healthcare professional that should have, you know, uh, headed that committee, not a senior advocate of Nigeria, but totally I, different. And I, also I, to I quickly mention um, that, you know, we, one of the things Aneta had shared earlier was that cholera you know, has killed you know, more yeah. than 2,000 people. And so, you know, it's almost at par with the same figures and for COVID-19. 
um, yeah, uh, it's almost at par with the with the fatalities for for COVID nineteen in Nigeria. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, same with cholera. But let's move away from health and um, some of all of that. Let's go to the southeast where you're from. Um, the sit at home order. It says here, sit at home, uh, crippling southeast. Governor's uh, lament is one of the things that we'll be talking about today. But I, I want to get your thoughts on. Um, the continued sit at home every Monday, even if the IPOB, you know, had initially put out a statement saying it was cancelled, but it seems like you know their members don't agree, and uh, people in the southeast still stay home every Monday. You know, you know, we have been on this for the past three, four weeks. Every time I come on there, we discuss this. In the past uh, four weeks now, every practically every week, and I've always been consistent in my uh, in, uh, in my view on what is happening in the South East. And one of those that believe that um, what is going on is uh, an aberration and we are practically crippling, the people of the South are practically crippling the economy of that region uh, with the sit at home order. Um, and I also said that IPO have lost the initiative. They started it, but as in, after the first week, they said, no, okay, we are going to cancel it. Let people move around. And people have to refuse to uh, go about their uh, different duties every Monday. Um, not because of the fact that uh, they really want to stay at home, as I've already said, but because of um, the fear that they'll be attacked. So it's good that the governors of the South East are coming in, the special governor, my, is coming out to say this now. But my challenge there is that I want to see what they can do. Let them not just be rhetorics. Let them be able to assure the people that their safety is guaranteed. They come out on Monday to go open their shops or go about their businesses that it will not be attacked. It is the fear that is uh, making people to stay at home. It's not just a total solidarity with uh, Nam De Kalu or Ipop yeah. or whatever. Yeah, but, but, but Mr. Wandu, Mr. Wandu, do you think there is something that the people of the Southeast can do um, if they are truly tired? Yes. Yeah. I've said it uh, often not. The, the fact is that they should just uh, go about their businesses. Um, pardon the use of word. I just feel that some people are just being foolish uh, by half by just saying that you won't go out on Mondays and rest of them because people have already said that. And but Mr. Uh, Wanda, we've seen cases of people who went about their businesses and what happened was that the IPOB members went ahead to harass them, destroy their goods. We have reports about a lorry here. Um, you, you know, these guys went to vandalize um, some properties of people when they go about their lawful businesses. So would you say it's the state governors who are not doing what they should? I said that before. I said the state governor should go out and come out and assure the not just um, saying it, just merely saying it in, in, in rhetoric terms, but also come out with policies that will make assure the people of their safety if they. If, then our security agencies, what's the police doing? What's the job of the police? We have also military information across the south. Is what are they doing? So I also think that they should come into play. We have um, the civil defense as well. We have the DSS. It is their duty to be able to um, secure the life and property of um, Nigerians within that place. So, but if the people are not seeing that out, that is why I said it's the fear of attack. Yes, I saw the the, the lorry you're talking about. It was car carrying bicycle uh, parts and rest of them. It was yes. set on fire. Yes, and um, it's a bet. I believe the governors can do more. It is with their the chief security officers of their state. So, if they cannot assure their people of their safety, then there is problem. If they can be able to do that and put in, in particular terms um, some measures that will guarantee the safety of life and properties of people in the south is you will see them coming out. But, but um, well, I think we're, we'll very likely we'll wrap up with this conversation. Um, we're going to have it, you know, a lot later also on the program. Um, but I want you, you know, to share why you think the governors don't seem to be taking these steps, like you've mentioned. There is a DSS, there is the NSCDC, there is the police, there is, you know, all the security formations um, that exist across the whole of the southeast. Um, that are at their disposal, I believe. So why do you think that they've decided to just ignore it and everyone sits at home on, on, on Mondays? Well, first and foremost, the governors don't have a right to overdo security. Yeah. Every a commission, you, you, you know that very well. The Commission of Police takes instruction from the IG in Abuja. The various um, uh, uh, military commanders take, um, the one in, uh, in the start is uh, those military commanders, they take order from the chief of army staff and the rest of them in Abuja. So most of it, that is why we have been cl clamoring for the state, poli uh, state policing. That is where the governors, uh, governors can have, uh, we have a right. If we have state policing and local policing, as we've been advocating over the years, 
then that's some of these issues. And the level of insecurity within, not only within the Southeast, across Nigeria will be reduced totally. But when we have a single structure of command for the security agencies, it becomes very difficult for the chief executives of that state, of those in this state, the, um, the governors um, in this instance, to do anything. When they give orders to the commission, if the commissioner doesn't get a directive from the inspector general of police in, in, uh, in Abuja, he might not be able to move. So but don't also forget that the police are also being under attack uh, in recent uh, by IPO. Then we also have to look at it. how many policemen do we have. We don't have enough. We don't have enough policemen. But even at that, the ones that we have are not even doing what they are doing. If you move from Lagos to, to the southeast and see the number of checkpoints, the number of policemen that are on the roads doing nothing. All they are doing is just extorting, extorting. Channel those security agencies into the state, states, various states and local government, and they will do their job. But you see them, about five or ten, ten of them at at every checkpoint, every five minutes to drive along that route, from right from um, um, Shagamu to Benin to Onisha, down to the uh, to Potako. You see them on the road, and several times the idea have said, go, I don't want to see any of you on the road, but on a daily basis, they are on the road. You see them in their tents, and people are continuing to continue kidnap people, even under their watch. So, I think there's a, there's a disconnect uh, within our security agencies and what is going on, and it's just getting too, too, too terrible. It's just since as nobody is in charge of what is um, in terms of security, nobody in charge. And I put that squarely on the last and on the table of the president. Because it almost, he's the chief executive of this country. Yeah, almost even seems intentional at, at, at this point. Uh, because these are, yeah. these are very, very simple things that you know nobody needs to read a book to know. But anyway, you thank you, uh, Mr. Chris Wandu, for your time. Uh, it's, it's always interesting hearing you. And of course, we wish you a, a very beautiful Tuesday ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. With love from Abuja. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. And uh, stay with us. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're going back in history. What happened on this day, the 7th of September? Um, I'm going to be telling you about um, Egypt and elections in 2005. And I'm going to back to the year 1996, tell you about the death of a hip-hop legend.